What's inside the digital to analog converter and what defines the quality? This video gives you some insight into DAX since more understanding might lead to better buying decisions. Every digital to analog converter, DAC for short, is built from a number of building blocks. The power supply, the input circuitry, the reach-away converter and the analog output circuit. With current to voltage conversion, they all have their influence on the sound quality and on the price. I will discuss them one by one. First there is the power supply that converts the AC voltage from the grid to one or more lower DC voltages needed by both digital and analog electronics. Digital electronics will need a voltage between 1.5 to 5 volts depending on the components used. Analog audio electronics will need higher voltages. I have seen DACs that had 24 volts DC on the analog circuits. More expensive DACs therefore often have two or more separate power supplies. There are two types of power supplies generally used. Linear power supplies and switch mode power supplies. Linear power supplies use relatively large transformers. Since they are wound from copper wire, they are relatively expensive due to the price of copper. Switch mode power supplies do not need a large transformer and therefore can be made a lot smaller and cheaper. Since this type of power supply works by very fast switching the voltage on and off, it can cause a lot of high frequency noise, something we don't like in audio. So high frequency switch mode power supplies need very well designed circuit boards and filtering, making them more expensive and thus you will not find them in lower end gear. Here cheaper, less well designed switch mode power supplies are often used. Sometimes both types can be found in one device, like here in the ELEC Alchemy DDP2. Here is the switch mode circuitry for the digital electronics and here the large transformer and the electronics of the linear power supply that powers the analog audio electronics. The designer even separated the digital electronics and the analog electronics fully by using separate circuit boards. Most DACs use a single power supply though and it can have enormous influence on the sound quality. Therefore it might pay to replace the cheap power supply that came with or in your DAC with aftermarket audio grade versions. Against popular belief the quality of both linear and switch mode power supplies can be very high but then the price will be high too. Brands like Mola Mola, Lin and Grim Audio use switch mode power supplies and we all know the sound quality of their products. It's not a working principle but how it is implemented that defines the quality. The second building block is the input circuitry. There are several kinds of inputs, although not every DAC has all of them. The first is the AES3 interface that knows three variants. SPDIF that uses an RCA plug, Optical that uses the Toslink optical connector and AES-EBU that uses a three pole XLR plug. For the largest part these three use the same data stream. The major difference between SPDIF and AES-EBU is the electrical specification. SPDIF needs a 75 ohm single core cable while AES-EBU needs a 110 ohm twin core cable. The voltage of the AES-EBU is also higher. The optical input uses an optical connector after which the optical signal is converted to electrical that then is fully identical to SPDIF. On professional source equipment some copy protection bits can be different but I have not seen DACs that are bothered by that. All three are so called isogenous interfaces, meaning that the sending device, the digital source, sends out the digital data at its pace so the DAC has to synchronize to the source. By using a special way of encoding, the clock signal is hidden in the digital stream. In my video Connecting Your DAC Number 2 How Digital Can Go Wrong from 2015, I describe this. Let's do a flashback. The digital signal starts out as square waves, looking like this. In all four AES3 versions this basic square wave is in fact the clock signal and the zero at the same time. 
ones are formed by a square wave of double the frequency. By alternating between square waves of either frequencies, both ones and zeros can be sent. This is how such a signal would look like with the clock cycles indicated by the dotted vertical lines. Whether a zero or one is sent can be seen by looking for the polarity change within a clock cycle. Looking at the first cycle we see the signal being high during the entire cycle. There is no change in polarity meaning it is a zero. The second cycle has a transition from low to high halfway the clock cycle and therefore is a one. It also could have been a transition from high to low. It is the polarity change within the cycle that counts. The third cycle remains low so no polarity change, thus a zero. The fourth cycle remains high, again no polarity change within the clock cycle, thus a zero. The fifth cycle goes from low to high halfway, so it is a one. This video also shows how bits might get lost, so if you are interested, links are in the top right corner, at the end of this video and in the show notes. Then there is the USB input. Here there are two standards, both using USB 2 cabling. USB audio class 1 and class 2. Class 1 is an old standard that is limited to 2 channel 96 kHz max. It is also an isogenous interface so the sending device sends out the digital data at its pace and the DAC has to synchronize to the source. Nowadays audio class 2 is used. This is an asynchronous interface, meaning that the sending device sends a packet of data and waits for the receiving device to ask for more. This way the receiving device, the DAC, is responsible for the clocking. Also here the implementation defines which sounds the best. Audio class 1 almost always is implemented poorly. Audio class 2 is therefore the preferred interface also since it can handle the highest sampling rates and multi-channel. The third interface is I2S. This was never intended for use between devices. It was developed to interface chips on the same circuit board. It uses three different lines, serial clock, word select and serial data. The serial clock tells the receiving device when a new bit is sent. The word select tells the receiving device if the data is for the left or the right channel and the serial data carries the audio bit. I2S is also isogenous, so the sending device defines the bit rate and thus the clock. But this time the clock signal isn't hidden in the audio bit stream but sent over a separate line. This is widely considered to be more robust than the AES3 solutions. Although there is a standard for I2S use in between chips inside a device, there is no standard for use between two separate devices. There are implementations that use three B and C cables, four RCA cables, an RJ45 cable, a cable with a mini DIN connector like here and the HDMI cable that is also on this DAC. The latter knows several pinout configurations, none of them compatible with each other or with the HDMI inputs on video equipment or AV receiver. Again it is the quality of the implementation on both sides of the cable that defines the audio quality. The possible fourth type of input is the network connection, as Ethernet jack and or as Wi-Fi. In fact this means that there is a kind of network player integrated into the DAC, thus it should be named streaming DAC. Again there are many possibilities. A streamer can be a DNA type of renderer, often combined with Apple AirPlay and Bluetooth renderer. But it can also be a Rune endpoint or Chromecast renderer. It might even be possible to combine all these possibilities in one streaming DAC. You might ask what the difference is with a network player. Well, the streaming DAC usually has more than one digital input. The streaming function is often an add-on. A network player might have one or two digital inputs, but the big difference is that it contains a music selecting function. It can often play by itself while the streaming DAC needs a DNA server and controller, a Logitech media server and a Squeezebox controller or a Rune server and a Rune controller. 
In many cases the streaming function of a streaming DAC isn't the strongest part of the design. It often pays to use an external quality streamer. Since Ethernet is asynchronous by nature, the streaming part of the DAC is the master clock, unless internally the streaming circuit is made slave to the DAC clock. Also here the implementation defines the audio quality. Here I end part 1 of this video. Next week part 2 will go online where I look at the DA conversion, the reconstruction filter, the IV conversion and the analog circuits. When that video is online a link to it will appear in the top right corner at the end of this video and in the show notes. So I'll be back next Friday at 5 pm Central European time. If you don't want to miss that, subscribe to this channel or follow me on the social media so you will be informed when new videos are out. Help me reach even more people by giving this video a thumb up or a link to this video in the social media. It is much appreciated. Many thanks to those viewers that support this channel financially. It keeps me independent and let me improve the channel further. If that makes you feel like supporting my work too, the links are on the comments below this video on YouTube. I'm Hans Beekhuizen, thank you for watching and see you in the next show or on the HBproject.com. And whatever you do, enjoy the music.